Hello and welcome to this uh, third clip on Cambridge Chemistry Challenge questions I've done. Uh, this is now the uh, second clip looking at um, the June 2017 paper. So I'm going to look at question two this time. So usually in a C3L6 paper, the second question out of the two will have an organic part to it, which means you need to think about the different organic topics that you'll have been studying throughout the first year of your A-level course. So like the front of every question paper usually suggests, you need to be having a, a mindset where you're thinking on the spot, being prepared to do some logical problem solving, instead of trying to revise and cram lots of information in preparation for the exam. Uh, you will need to do that. The exam is written so that it's about a problem solving approach, rather than lots and lots of recall. So don't forget to keep on top of any maths that you get into. Um, laying out your steps clearly, uh, making sure your units are being converted properly, you use the, an appropriate or reasonable number of significant figures and taking care of orders of magnitude. So I know that I say this every time when I do a, a C3L6 clip, but uh, they, they provide you with uh, a periodic table to use. So it comes with the paper, so always use the values from this particular periodic table, not ones that you may have happened to remember or recall from your exam board, one that you've been working with all year. So this particular question, it's about, uh, like it says, drugs made from bromoalkanes. So that's designed to actually sort of settle your mind a little bit, uh, because they'll know that you'll have studied haloalkanes as part of your first year course. So before we even get started on the question, it actually gives you something quite important. It says, for part A to F of this question, you can assume that only one hydrogen atom in each alkane is replaced by a bromine atom when the alkanes react with bromine. So I'm going to pop that in a little box to, to refer to, just as a reminder as we work through it. So in part A, it says, one mole of ethane reacts with one mole of bromine to, make, to give bromoethane. Write a balanced equation for this reaction. State symbols are not required. So that part's a really easy part to get you started. Okay, so the next part, it says, how would you classify this reaction? It says, circle only one the answer booklet. So it's obviously a substitution. And the next question says, the reaction between ethane and bromine requires light and does not proceed in the dark. The light is needed to break a bond and to start the reaction. Which bond is broken by the light? So you'll no doubt recognise this from your work on alkanes and radical substitution. So it's the bromine-bromine bond being broken, which is the initiation step. So moving on to part B, it gives you some information about when ethane reacts with bromine. So it says any one of six hydrogen atoms can be replaced. So because it's talking about replacing hydrogen atoms, I'm just going to refer you back to what the earlier part of the question told us. I've highlighted my little box at the top in blue. So it says the symmetry in the molecule of ethane means that all six of these hydrogen atoms are equivalent, and so there's only one possible product no matter which hydrogen is replaced. With larger alkanes, there is often the possibility of forming different structural isomers of the bromoalkane product, depending on which hydrogen atom is replaced by a bromine atom. So they've brominated methyl butane and showed you the four different places in which bromine can be substituted. So they're labelled um, A, B, C and D. So in part B it says assuming all the hydrogen atoms are present or, or all the hydrogen atoms present in methyl butane are equally likely to be replaced, which of the bromoalkanes A to D would you expect to be formed in the smallest proportion? Give the letter A to, A to D and the systematic name of the bromoalkane. So think about carbocations here. You've talked about how carbocations when you've studied alkenes, and tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary, secondary more stable than primary. Taking that idea and sort of cutting and pasting it onto the propagation stage, for any of these um, products, A, B, C and D, to form, what's got to happen is a bromine radical has got to attack the actual uh, methyl butane molecule somewhere. If you look at B, you can see that the bromine is actually bonded at a tertiary carbon position. That would mean that the carbon-hydrogen bond 
that would have had to have been broken for the bromine to come on and substitute hydrogen would have been more stable, so harder for the bromine radical to attack in the propagation stage. So from that you conclude that, conclude that B is least likely to form. So they also wanted the systematic name of that particular um, haloalkane, so it's 2-bromo-2-methylbutane. So using the same logic, we made a bit of an assumption. We took the, um, the idea of tertiary carbocations being more stable and then sort of applied that to the radical substitution mechanism. So it said in part C, using the same assumption, calculate the percentage of the four products A to D that you would expect to find in the mixture. So let's take the idea of primary versus tertiary versus secondary. Tertiary, least likely. Um, secondary, less likely. Primary, more likely, due to different stabilities. So if we have already decided that B is the least likely to form, which one is the most likely? So we've already worked out using a bit of um, alkene style chemistry and carbocation chemistry that B is the least likely. So the substitution position is one position out of 12 that you could have. So that's one out of 12, which is 8.3%. So C represents two positions out of 12, so for C it needs to be twice that percentage. So A will represent six possible positions out of 12. So basically what I do is I take the probability of one position out of 12 being 8.3 and I can multiply up accordingly. So multiply 8.3 times 3, it gets me 24.9. 8.3 times um, 6 gives me 49.8. So if you wanted to, you could round up or down accordingly to make it uh, add up to 100 in terms of the percentages. So that's now moving on to the next part of the question. So now what they do is they raise the challenge by giving you actual data from this reaction which doesn't match what you worked out. So it says to determine which position is the most reactive under these conditions, in, in other words the preference of any particular hydrogen to be replaced by bromine, we have to compare the ratio of the percentage of each product actually produced with that predicted in part C. So this gives a measure of the inherent reactivity of each position. So I've taken the rounded examples from before and what we can do is compare them to this one. So in part D what you need to do is you need to divide the actual percentage over predicted percentage. OK, so let's lay out our calculation. So that gives us 11.2 and 0.378 for those particular two. So the relative reactivity is the ratio of these two answers, which gives you 29.7. So in this one, part E, what they want us to do is work out the different bromoalkane alkane structural isomers could be formed. Now, when they say bromine, bromoalkane structural isomer, they mean a monosubstitution. In other words, only one hydrogen is replaced by bromine, because they told us to use that idea earlier on in the question. So it's, it's important to remember that in symmetrical molecules, the number of possible positions are mirrored. So what this means, effectively, is for each possible position you think of, there'll be an identical one on the other side of the molecule, splitting it down its line of symmetry. So the actual positions you count up will actually be halved because for any one there'll be an, an identical one on the other side. So taking the first one, you have three possible positions. In cyclohexane, all positions are equivalent, so only one position can be considered. For the third one, three possible positions. So in the next one you've got four positions because one of the carbons doesn't have any hydrogens attached, it's got four bonds already to other carbons. So remembering, even though this structure 
is a bit odd compared to things you may or may not have seen before. You can still apply the same idea. So it's the number of positions that are different to each other in terms of the carbon environment. So here you've got three. So this slightly tougher one, think about how many hydrogens are attached to each carbon, then you can differentiate between the different types of environments. So you've got position type 1, which is CH2 environment, and then position type 2, which is just a CH environment. So therefore, that means you've only got two positions in total. So if we take this compound 1,3-dimethyladamantane, uh, we want you to think about is how many different ways could one bromine be substituted for one hydrogen. So using the same logic, there are five. So if we go back to the top of the page, you can see that the tertiary structure is formed in greatest abundance, 93.5%. So here, positions three and four are the tertiary structures. So therefore, what we've got to do is draw a structure that has bromine coming off at either of these two positions. So what you would do is obviously redraw the structure with the bromine in one of those two places. So let's move on to the next question. So we can take compound E from the last section and look at what it's asking us to do in part G. So if we just highlight the reagents here, um, we've got something called a nitrile. You might not have come across nitriles before, but the N triple bond C um, is uh, a nucleophilic carbon. So if you look carefully at what they tell you, it shows you what happens when an organic R group bonded to a Br undergoes what we call the Ritter reaction. So therefore, what you take do is take the Br off and put uh, an NH with a C double bond O and a methyl added onto it. Now the way in which the, uh, the nitrile, the C triple bond N, and the H2SO4 and the H2O works, you don't have to, have to be aware of that, you're not expected to know that as a first year, so they're giving you some information. The ratio reaction isn't even second year, it's, it's in university and beyond. So all we have to do is take the BR off and put something else on. So I'm going to take the structure on the top left, that represents compound E. You could equally do it with the one on the right, so just in the interest of saving time, I'm going to do it with one of them. So it tells you that you end up with an Na plus ion. That must mean that sodium hydroxide breaks up into Na plus and OH minus. It also means the OH minus must do something. So an OH minus contains a lone pair that is able to undergo nucleophilic um, activity. In other words, form a data covalent bond. So the OH minus ion can react with the carbon in C double bond O, as I've labelled in the diagram. So therefore, if you think about it, what's going to happen is the, the hydrogen will combine with the nitrogen, and the oxygen in the OH will uh, bond to the carbon. So you get memantine, anion G minus, and obviously that can combine or interact ionically with the sodium ion as the reaction scheme is suggesting. So like I, I usually say, it goes from hard to easy, then to hard again. So this is an easy bit, because part G was quite deductive and difficult, specifically for a first-year chemist. So all you have to really do is uh, give three structural isomers of C386Br2. So in this next part, it asks you to calculate the percentage of 1,3-dimorphopropane that we produced. In this mixture, if all of the hydrogen atoms are equally likely to be replaced. So remembering that two moles of bromine is four bromine atoms, it says if two moles of bromine are added to one mole of propane, then the mixture is subjected to light. So in your propane molecule, you've got two positions for substitution with Br. So position one for the first bromination is six out of eight. So if we go to the opposite position 1, the chances are that it's 3 out of 7. So there's 7 remaining unsubstituted hydrogens in total, and there's 3 of them that exist on the opposite position 1. So the first probability is either of the two position 1s. Now assuming that the, the, the bromination occurs on the position 1 that I've left the arrow on on the left hand side, 
the other position 1 is opposite, so that's 3 out of 7. So if you multiply those two prob probabilities together, you get 0 0.32. So assuming that the possibility, or the probability, sorry, sorry of all the positions being equal, equal in, in likelihood, then you've got 32%. So in the next part, it says, unfortunately, no 1,3-dimer propane is reduced because other isomers are actually favoured. So it says another hydrocarbon does react with bromine to give 1,3-dibromopropane. And this hydrocarbon contains 85.63% carbon by mass, and when it reacts with bromine, it gives no other products other than 1,3-dibromopropane. So I've put in 1,3-dibromopropane so you can see what we're talking about. So because it's a hydrocarbon, you must have 85.63% of carbon and 14.37% of hydrogen. So doing the normal empirical formula calculation, you get a ratio of 7.1358 to 14.37. So the empirical formula is CH2, so that's, this means it must be an alkene. But the problem with assuming it's an alkene is if you look at the equation at the bottom left-hand uh, side of the screen, reacting an alkene with bromine, uh, or this particular alkene, what, um, propene, you'd get 1,2-dibromopropane. So 1,2-dibromopropane, but they said they want 1,3-dibromopropane. So the only other isomer of C3H6, we know it's going to be a 3-carbon um, compound because it produces a 3-carbon um, product. Uh, so hydrocarbon H has to be cyclopropane, which can be drawn one of those two ways. So it's only one product, so it must be an addition reaction. So this takes some of the ideas we developed earlier into more applied territory using complex-looking compounds. So it asks you for compound I and reagent J. So if you look at the starting material, the only place where a dibromoalkane could react with that is at the nitrogen atom, because the nitrogen atom will have a substitution take place for the bromoalkane. So you're not meant to know this but from memory. You're meant to use some just a bit of common sense to deduce that that's the most likely place that a substitution might happen. So why am I assuming substitution? So if you look in the final product, uh, carpropamine, uh, you actually have a carbon chain substituted on the nitrogen. So you have to prepare for that to happen. So to do that, you've got to react your 1,3-dibromopropane directly with your starting material. So in other words, one of the bromines um, reacts and as you'd expect, it comes off as an HBr. So by looking at uh, the other part of carpipramine, you can see quite easily what reagent J is going to be. So all you're doing is using 1,3-dibromopropane to form a bridge between the starting material and compound I. So again, you'd make HBr as a side product. So this takes a similar compound to carpipramine. Can't even say it right, can I? Carpipramine. We'll have to do with that. And introduces an organic synthesis pathway for it. So you might notice some familiar structures like C triple bond N. Uh, you might notice that there's some 1,3-dibromopropane involved. And you might notice there's also a uh, bromomethane involved next to where it says compound N. So there's several kind of ideas to try and pull together at once here. So it says the carbon atoms in ethoheptazine, which are not already present in the starting material, either come from 1,3-dibromopropane or from ethanol. No carbon-carbon bonds are broken during the synthesis. No carbon-carbon single bonds, that is. So all you have to do is circle the three carbon atoms in ethoheptazine which come from 1,3-dibromopropane and in the answer booklet, or which you don't have for this clip but um, I can do it in a second on the blank space circle the two carbon atoms in ethoheptazine which come from ethanol so let's draw ethoheptazine a bit bigger okay so the ethanol part 
uh, wouldn't be too difficult, but the 1,3-dibromopropane might have been a bit more difficult. It's the only place where you find three carbons in a row, and one of them is bonded to a nitrogen atom, like we talked about a couple of seconds ago. So there's two clues there that tell you that, that is the, those are the carbons from 1,3-dibromopropane. So in part M we have four species to work out, and it says the synthesis of ethylheptazine takes five steps. In the first step, the starting material is deprotonated, that means uh, hydrogen is removed. So think about where a hydrogen might be able to be removed to give a carbanion. So the anion is going to have the negative charge in that position because that's the tertiary position, and like we looked at earlier, the tertiary position can be assumed to be the most stable. So if you're removing an electron from a carbon, it needs to be somewhere where there's the maximum number of other carbons bonded to it. So for compound L, the part that I've added on, or substituted on, I should say, is in red, which obviously comes from 1,3-dibromopropane, which is the uh, from carb carbon ion K- minus going to compound L, you use 1,3-dibromopropane. So for cation M+, plus, what you've got to think about is what happens to that 1,3-dibromopropane, uh, what, what the sort of that red part of the molecule in compound L. You know that you're trying to produce um, a cyclic compound with nitrogen in it. So let's just draw the, um, the aromatic ring first and construct the rest of the compound. So I'm just going to put my triple bond in, in there. And... Uh, I'm also going to put in uh, where I think that dibromopropane is going to end up. So because it's dibromopropane, it has to have three carbons in it. So if we've got three carbons, they could go in that position. So that now makes that nitrogen positively charged. So in the final part, what I did was construct a structure that could end up as ethylheptazine in the same way that we did what's called the Ritter reaction earlier. If you rewind the clip, or if you have the paper in front of you, you can look at where they talked about the Ritter reaction. So that takes us to the end of this clip. Again, uh, a slightly more difficult organic type one that develops ideas further and further and further. So if you're going to give the Cambridge Chemistry Challenge a go, um, try to sort of realise that you, you can think your way through it logically. It is challenging, obviously, but you can think your way logically through it using the clues that you're given. So in the meantime... Thanks for listening, and until next time, see you soon.